Hey everyone, welcome in. Thanks for joining me. Today I'd like to discuss um, the topic of compassion and intimacy a little bit. And um, I chose these two words because they are really alive in my practice right now and, you know, over the years. And I also see them as both like powerful and strong words and often words that can be interpreted a lot of different ways. So I thought we can talk a little bit about um, these words first of compassion and intimacy and then the practice of them uh, more through a Buddhist lens, but also just a, a general meditation lens. And uh, yeah, go a little bit deeper. So first, the word compassion, uh, which evokes a lot of different things for people. And uh, compassion itself, as I said, you know, can have a lot of different definitions uh, from obviously different religious traditions all the way to uh, more secular compassion work or just generally as as humans, compassion is a part of our life. It's a part of our makeup. It's a part of, of our bones, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, yet in Buddhism, uh, we tend to define things pretty precisely a lot of the time. But, uh, you know, there is a general definition for compassion, which I'll, I'll give in a moment. But what I've found over the years is that compassion is actually one of these elusive things in Buddhism that may seem simplistic on face value. But once we start to merge it with the uh, non-dual teachings of Buddhism, the teachings on shunyata, compassion becomes a lot wider, first of all. And actually what it is uh, becomes a little bit more difficult to describe. But nonetheless, I'm going to try to describe it at a few different levels here. And so um, how we usually define compassion in a, in a more straightforward way is the aspiration or wish for ourselves and others to be free from any kind of pain, suffering, dissatisfaction, and the causes of that pain or dissatisfaction. So, you know, this covers a lot of life. <laughs> a lot of us spend, you know, large parts of our weeks or days um, averting from things that we dislike, averting from things that are uncomfortable that we don't want to be around or do we don't want to continue. And, you know, if we look closely at our minds, we can see that's at a core, you know, a core level of our behavior, of our conduct, is we're trying to avoid things that are um, painful. And yet compassion, even in the sense of this, this kind of straightforward way of describing it, the, the aspiration or wish to be free from uh, pain, suffering, etc., and its causes for oneself and others, um, by adding causes, it's not such a direct, simple, um, okay, now this is painful, this is uncomfortable, compassion is getting it away as quickly as possible. Actually, in Buddhism, we would kind of uh, say the opposite. That compassion is more about becoming intimate with all of the things we can come into contact with in life. And all of the things, uh, for most of us, include quite a bit of undesirable things, things that we wish weren't there. Um, again, we can use lots of different words for this. I think suffering is not always the best word, but let's just say things that are unpleasant, uncomfortable. Of course, we all don't want you know strong physical pain or, or strong emotional pain, but in this you know, category I'm speaking on, and it also just includes, um, you know, slight dis dissatisfaction when things aren't, you know, quite going our way, a, a mood that's slightly down or something we don't want to be with. And so compassion includes, strangely enough, actually becoming intimate or learning to be with both the pleasant and the unpleasant. Because usually the pleasant, what's desirable, what's pleasurable, we want to continue, you know, we, we often cling to that, we try to increase it, where what's unpleasant, we try to push away. So a lot of, of Buddhism, um, you know, even in, as the philosophy gets very complex and technical, sometimes, um, a lot of it is is really centered around these two issues of, you know, getting to know how we cling, and seeing the pain around that, and also getting to know how we we avert, or we push away, and how that also causes a lot of problems, right? So, you know, just something to think about real quick in this department, if this is kind of new to you. You know, did 
did it necessarily enhance your life to get away from something that was uncomfortable or unpleasant? No, I'm not talking about something that we can change, like, you know, going to a doctor, healing a sickness, et cetera. We should do that. <laughs> you know, if a, if a relationship isn't working out and we need to shift something or we need to put a boundary with someone, I'm not really talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about more the subtle things throughout our, our week, throughout our day, uh, months, years, et cetera, where we we're, we're always looking for that kind of Goldilocks opportunity, which also, you know, doesn't allow us to settle, first of all, because we're always shifting, trying to find that Goldilocks opportunity. And then at the same time, it doesn't help us to develop more intimacy with life. So now this word intimacy, um, I'm using it in a very specific way. Um, I don't know if you Google it, you'll find different definitions, but basically it's the process or act of becoming close with something. Now we usually use the word intimacy to, re to represent closeness in a human relationship or, or maybe a relationship with a pet or something like that. And, um, and yet, you know, when we look at the definition of the word intimacy, there's intimacy happening all the time. And as meditators, whether we, you know, adopt the Buddhist path or not, a lot of meditation practice is about becoming intimate with our minds and our minds include our thoughts, emotions. Of course, we're including our, our physicality, our body, our soma, all the, the, the feeling world that arises within the body, uh, our perception. So these are all things that we can become intimate with that actually, of course, can involve another person or, or groups of people or, you know, non-human beings, et cetera, pets, animals, you know, the wind. <laughs> but, but a lot of the intimacy in Buddhist practice and in meditation practice is about becoming intimate with ourselves, you know, what we take to be self, but actually are just different kinds of phenomena that are arising. For instance, if we hear something, we can become intimate with that. I think when we fall in love with a song or it just gets us moving, right? Actually, intimacy is happening. So a lot of our intimacy, we don't notice, it just happens. But when we cultivate it on purpose, especially with these, I guess you could say more polarizing experiences in our life, the ones that are unpleasant, the ones that are a little more clingy on the other side, um, we start to learn uh, deeper and more profound lessons about our humanity, about how the mind works, right? So core to my meditation practice over the years and, and, and Buddhist practice, you know, has really led me to, it's not quite an obsession. That was the first word that came to mind. It's more like a, a, a process, a, a relationship to um, a passion, maybe is a better word than obsession, a passion for um, getting to know my mind, getting to know what life is all about. Because life happens inside of us. I mean, of course, it happens in relation to the world, but we're the one perceiving. You know, it's it's our movie screen, so to speak, of mind that everything's being projected on and interacted with, right? So, so intimacy is is something I think is it's a core value. It's it's a core practice. It's something that you know we can let happen naturally and spontaneously, which is fine. Uh, but we can also cultivate it. And especially when we bring these two things together, a practice of compassion and a practice of compassion that leads us to more intimacy with ourselves and others. So bringing compassion back in, um, again, just presenting it initially here as this idea <clears throat> that we don't have to immediately shift or uh, uh, move away from something that is unpleasant. And that includes, you know, witnessing something unpleasant in someone else, right? So usually we associate compassion with um, how we treat someone else. And of course, that's included here. But what I'm trying to present is a rounder view that it's, it's not just about others, and it's also not just about ourselves. It's about the whole thing. It's about life. It's about how we interact with ourselves, how we interact with others. So, of course, we, we can practice compassion for others. But what does that look like? It actually looks like moving towards things that are unpleasant. When someone is having a problem, when they're having a difficulty, when they're going through you know, a life crisis or whatever it is, 
how do we poise ourselves to meet that person, to actually be a fellow human being in an intimate connection, right? My take on this personally is, of course, you know, if something's in front of us and someone we love or, or just someone we're concerned with, stranger, close person, whatever, and they need our help, they need our compassion, we provide it as best we can, right? But I found over the years that it, it it's limiting what I can actually provide or do if I haven't done the work of compassion and intimacy with my own difficulties, my own problems, uh, my moods, you know, when, in my feeling world when things just don't feel quite right or I'm struggling with uh, certain ruminating thoughts. And so as a meditator, a lot of our um, compassionate intimacy happens internally. And then, of course, the point is that can influence how we express compassion to others. The point is not to keep it for ourselves. The point is to actually deepen the practice of compassion through becoming more intimate with our life and human experience on an internal land, you know, in, in our internal landscape, in our internal, in our internal world, so that we can better serve others, so that we can show up for others, including ourselves. So I think um, often we're, we're very quick to shift to compassion for others. And, and if that's natural, that's wonderful. That's how it should be. I think that's why it's a, just a basic human quality. We all have compassion. Because you can see when, when there's a moment where someone's in pain or there's a, there's a natural disaster or something just happened, we all kind of spring to action or, or a lot of us do. So we can see it's, it's a natural birthright that we have compassion. But it's also something we can train in moments uh, that, that, you know, where others or ourselves aren't in crisis. And we can train to live from compassion. And this, one it start, and this is when it starts to get a little bit deeper, uh, where for me, from the Buddhist traditions, when we're talking about compassion, we're also talking about openness. We're also talking about this sense of how we hold ourselves and hold others either in, the, in a tight grip of, of solidity, of I'm this and they are that, etc., uh, strong opinions, strong, strong opinions, strong judgments, etc. Or we can hold things in a little bit more fluidity and, and flexibility. And I've noticed the fluidity that we develop through practices of, of Buddhist non-duality, sometimes what we call Vipassana meditations, different kinds of things like that. They start to shift our relationship to self, how we view self as kind of like this singular box you know, at, at, at any given moment when we're clinging to a certain emotion or thought or personality trait or even the body. So Vipassana practices or insight meditation practices start to shift that. And why do they shift that? Because they show us there's, there's a much wider view that we can inhabit. And why can we inhabit that wider view? Because that's how things are. Things are not, aren't actually boxed in. And, you know, just a simple example of this is, you know, you ask 10 different people, you know, what do you want to eat for lunch? You're not all going to get the same answer. You're going to get different answers. So there's all a view of what's quote unquote best or desirable. So that means there isn't a singular desirable thing. This is one example. We use logical reasoning like this sometimes in the Buddhist traditions um, just to show like everything's nature is actually fluid. It doesn't mean things are, uh, how do you say it? Things can be whatever we want. No, there is an order to things. There's cause and effect. But things are open. They're more fluid. So when we start to connect with that in meditation, um, and then we merge that with becoming intimate or a little bit more intimate with our own uh, uh, dissatisfaction or, like I said, uh, things that are unpleasant or uncomfortable, that's when we start to have a little bit of magic in the practice. And by magic, I don't mean like esoteric. I mean like a spark of what we naturally are, which is open and interconnected, right? So compassion and um, becoming more intimate with our internal world helps us to open um, into those spaces, helps us to embody um, not only more of our humanity, but I would just say more of our, our awakened mind, right? Because it's right there. 
Uh, in Buddhism, we sometimes talk about awakening as something, as a spiritual process that is, is long and arduous and ends up in some kind of, you know, result. But other kinds of traditions and other ways of looking at it don't look at it that way. They just look at it as like a shift or a, a slight look in a different direction back to what we naturally are. And, you know, we could sort of say, what, well, what are we naturally, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm not going to answer that here, but because we're talking about compassion and intimacy, to me, compassionate, compassion in this kind of openness where we stop fighting life, we learn to, we learn to become more fluid, more open with others ourselves. Um, you know, I think this is, this is sort of closer to what we are because, you know, often when a strong emotion happens, when, when something unpleasant is happening, when we're struggling, uh, with a life issue, that feels like what we are, but that's actually temporary and permanent. So, you know, we can see it's not what we are. It's changing all the time. But anyway, so uh, back to our topic here. Um, <laughs> so, so how to become intimate? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to it, but I'll say some things direct, you know, a little bit more directly now. How do we become intimate with our, um, our pain, so to speak? For me, I'm a big fan of somatically leaning into things. And what this means is in the body, when we feel uh, something's off, and again, I wouldn't take the strongest thing first, just like a slight mood of, you know, oh, I'm a little tired today, I didn't sleep so well, and there's this kind of, maybe there's a little stress around that, or there's a little bit of doubt if we can get through our day. We just lean into that and release. So the lean, for me, is kind of, it means feeling the feeling in the body, feeling the sensation or the internal energy. For me, stress often appears as tightness and constriction in the body, chest, abdomen, etc. So I might just move towards that. So that's what I mean by leaning in. Move towards that and let go. <laughs> let go doesn't mean try to get rid of it, right? That actually wouldn't be a compassionate approach. Let go means let go of trying to control it. Let go of trying to make it into something it's not. Just let it be what it is, right? And be with that. So again, we let be, or we let be with what an emotion, a sensation, a feeling tone in the body is, and we leave it alone, right? And this takes some practice. Um, you know, this is not something I'm saying, you know, some of you may immediately be able to do. And you're always welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to help with this kind of work. You can also um, uh, check out uh, some of my teacher's work, uh, Sony Rinpoche. Um, he has a lot of wonderful practices on how to lean into or be with our feeling world, uh, namely a practice called the handshake practice. So you can you can just Google that and it'll come up. Um, but anyways, either way, the the idea, whatever practice we do, is to lean in and allow things to be. And there's a release there, not because the pain necessarily goes away, but the release is the release of control the release of trying to manipulate, the release of um, basically, you know, trying to avert or push away something that's unpleasant. So again, coming back to compassion, that is the compassion. The compassion is not that it goes away. The compassion is, is in how we approach, how we poise ourselves in relation to our internal landscape in this, in this case. And that in itself is creating more intimacy with our emotions, more intimacy with our soma and our feeling world, and more intimacy with our minds, okay? So where compassion, I think, becomes a little more diffuse to describe is because it's not a particular emotion. It's, it's, a, it's a series of, of emotions. And it's, it's a little bit closer to an intention, but it's also, as I said earlier, for me, a way of being. Uh, so we can cultivate that way of being and we can open that up. And over the years, I found that what especially opens that up is looking into the nature of things, you know, using, again, I already mentioned the word different kinds of insight meditation practices or the Sanskrit word we use is Vipassana uh, practices and um, engaging with the Dharma a little bit engaging with 
you know, the teachings on non-duality. And these help us to start to understand what we're aiming towards and, of course, help to inform the practice we're doing. But over time, we, we can get experiences of openness. And it's kind of like two sides of, of, of one coin. If we practice compassion in the way I was describing, we can also experience openness in, in what I'm referring to here, uh, more through the non-dual teachings of Buddhism. And then, of course, if we experience openness, we can experience compassion. Why? Because when we experience openness, there's not all of this solidification and strong barriers and judgments around what we are and or what others are and and or what a particular phenomenon like a thought or something like that is. There's more openness. There's more curiosity. There's more fluidity. So um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, just some ideas to share with you. And, you know, if you want to practice this kind of stuff and you're curious, feel free to reach out, leave a comment here if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening, you know, uh, to, to my podcast on Spotify or somewhere else, um, reach out. You can always reach out to me at scotttusa.com. So thanks so much, everyone. Wishing you a great day. Take care.